Okay. All righty. Well, um, welcome everyone. Uh, today is October 31st, 2021. We are very happy to have with us Bob Harris from New Jersey. I know a lot of people who have joined us here on Zoom are familiar with who Bob is, but for all of our friends that uh, are watching this on Facebook and YouTube and, well, wherever they are watching this recording, we are very happy to introduce Bob for those of you who have yet to know him. Mr. Bob Harris discovered the Baha'i faith in 1968 in the midst of a ruinous war, political riots, racial polarization, assassination, and widespread dread and despair. The Baha'i teachings saved his life. Bob has served as Continental Counselor and on the Northeast Regional Council for the Baha'is. He has found that love is the vaccine and the treatment we need to heal our own selves and our world. This week's topic is Abdul Baha's mission. The topic of this talk is the life of Abdul Baha has been presented in countless books, news articles, and films over the past 150 years. He is recognized as a transformational leader all over the world by members of every religion. As we approach the centenary of his passing, the interest in his ethics, philosophy, and speeches is reaching a crescendo. We will explore very simply what he taught and what he prescribed be a part of the changes to come. This will be a practical answer to the question, what can I do? I'm going to share my screen right now for the opening prayer. It's not the prayer I sent you, is it? Yes, this is the prayer you sent. John, yeah, don't, don't, don't share it now, John. We'll share it when, uh, when Joan will be reading it in a few minutes. It's just a couple of minutes. Oh, okay. So we'll say that later. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, with that being said, uh, we are ready to share the PowerPoint then. Um, welcome, Bob. How are you? Hi. Um, whoops. I'm just fine. And uh, I thank you so much, John, for, uh, for hosting this and for uh, all the folks who showed up to um, all the folks who showed up to be with us today. Uh, this is a lot of fun for me to be back in Clearwater and uh, so many great memories of my 10 years with you. And as we approach the centenary of his passing, uh, what an honor it is to be speaking about Abdul Baha. All over the world, we are recalling uh, his lifetime of love and labor given to the world, given to all of us. His writings, his acts of kindness, his speeches, his service, every aspect of his life was dedicated to the beautiful call to raise aloft the banner of the oneness of mankind. You can put the prayer up now, John, because we're going to start with a prayer that he wrote for us, describing his overarching mission to the world, that we should strive to raise aloft the banner of the oneness of mankind. Joan, if you could, please. O oh, thou kind Lord, thou hast created all humanity from the same stock. Thou hast decreed that all shall belong to the same household. In they are all thy servants, and all mankind are sheltered beneath thy tabernacle. All have gathered together at the table of bounty, and all are illumined through the light of thy divine, thy providence. O oh God, thou art kind to all, thou hast provided for all, thou dost shelter all, conferrest life upon all. Thou hast endowed all, each and all, with talents and faculties, and all are submerged in the ocean of thy mercy. O oh, thou kind Lord, unite all. Let the religions agree and make the nations one 
so that they may see each other as one family and the whole earth as one home. May they all live together in perfect harmony. O oh God, erase the loft the banner of the oneness of mankind. O oh God, establish the most great peace. Cement thou, O oh Lord, the hearts together. O oh thou kind Father, God, gladden our hearts through the fragrance of thy love. Brighten our eyes through the light of thy guidance. Delight our ears with the melody of thy word and shelter us all in the stronghold of thy providence. Thou art the mighty and powerful. Thou art the forgiving and thou art the one who overlooketh the shortcomings of all mankind. John, thank you so much. It's great to see you. We can take that down now, John. <clears throat> Uh, raise aloft the banner of the oneness of mankind. Uh, isn't that really the essence of the person of Abdul Baha? Doing everything he could to keep people together, to bring them together, east and west. And isn't that our mandate as well? Thinking of Abdul Baha and the way he loved people, encouraged people, made them happy, personally brought them together, it is so obvious that we are not dealing with an ordinary individual. Abdul Baha is surely unique in religious history and singular in the history of this world. He's a transformational figure for this world and will be seen more and more as that as the centuries roll on. No one else was ever empowered in writing by the prophet of God to be the interpreter of a new revelation. No one before was ever given the job to outline the organization and administration of the new revelation. No one was ever before designated as the exemplar of the teachings of a new religion, to be the example in real life of what acts of holy service would look like. He's our example of how to be a human being, and so we need to learn more about him. His uniqueness is touching and powerful. This is a unique story. Abdul Baha was arrested at the age of eight. His father was in the black pit of Tehran and his family, including Abdul Baha, were under arrest. And for the next 58 years, he was a prisoner of the Persian government and the Ottoman Empire. Abdul Baha entered prison as a little boy, and he left it as an old man. And as soon as he was free in 1908, with no education, no formal training, limited contact with the press, no experience speaking to large public groups, he started to travel and to speak of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. Travel was not easy in those days, but he made his way to Paris, to London twice in those cases, Egypt three times, Stuttgart, Budapest, Vienna, New York, Washington, Chicago, California, Montreal, and Philadelphia, and he showed us that he was created to bring his father's teachings to the West. This is a good time to recall the life and times and teachings of Abdul Baha and to refresh our minds about how close we are to the time that this luminous person lived among us. Millions of Baha'is are familiar with the life and teachings of this magnetic and endearing figure. And, but to provide an overview of why we revere Abdul Baha, we invite you to look at this six minute video. This is a good time to put that video up. It's all summed up in the final image. His words really express simply what it's all about. It says to be a Baha'i simply means to love all the world, to love humanity, and to try to serve it, to work for universal peace and universal brotherhood. If we could play that now, that would be great.
Thanks very much. Isn't that beautiful? Abdul Baha's mission was to break down any barriers, whatever they may be, that separated people. At the International Peace Conference in Lake Mohonk, Abdul Baha boldly stated that war was the product of hatred in hearts. He said that a new spirit must settle into the human mind that would push out prejudice, long standing divisions, and bring the dawn of a new day in human relations. He linked universal peace with topics such as women's suffrage, a, a world tribunal, collective security, the necessity of religious unity, and the crying need for racial justice. Abdul Baha impressed many international peace experts when he said that the problem of war was not about treaties and trade and tariffs and weapons and sovereignty, but rather it's a matter of the goodness found within the human heart. His approach was transformational, and that means that we need to transform ourselves in order to make it work. He wants to change the whole system. While he was in America, he took bold actions that surprised his hosts and challenged long-standing American customs. Before he even walked off the ship that brought him to New York City, he was asked by about 30 press people from the New York press about votes for women. Did he think women deserved the right to vote? This was a very big issue in the presidential election of 1912. This is right in the middle of that presidential election. And without any hesitation, he said, yes, they should vote. He strongly stated that men and women need to be equal in all aspects of life. Abdul Baha described gender equality through a powerful analogy of a bird attempting to fly. Quote, the world of humanity is possessed of two wings, the male and as these two wings are not equivalent in strength, the bird will not fly. Until womankind reaches the same degree as man, until she enjoys the same arena of activity, humanity will way to heights of real attainment. Perhaps the most dramatic words and actions he took during his trip came on the subject of race in 1912, the country was torn with racial division, and separate but equal was the very highest level of interracial relations to which our nation aspired. Abdul Baha challenged America to go far beyond tolerance, to embrace diversity completely, to justice, and demolish racial barriers in law, in education, and even in marriage. Abdul Baha demonstrated his commitment to racial equality by bold and unconventional actions from his very first days in America. In Washington, D.C., he set the tone at a luncheon in his honor on April 23rd, 1912, just weeks after he got here, held at the lavish home of a very prominent Persian diplomat. Looking around this elegant dining room at all the white faces, Everyone seated according to rank and social position and in keeping with the strict Washington social protocol, Abdul Baha stood up and asked his host, where is Mr. Gregory? Bring Mr. Gregory. The embarrassed diplomat had no choice but to hastily arrange place settings and make room for the extra guest, the black attorney, Louis Gregory who had escorted Abdul Baha to the diplomat's house from a morning lecture. Mr. Gregory was quietly taking his leave when Abdul Baha insisted that he join the party and occupy the honored place to his right at the head of the table. Thus in a single stroke, Abdul Baha defied Washington protocol and swept aside the practice of segregation by race and categorization by social rank, setting a powerful example and challenging the customs of our still deeply divided capital city. Throughout his visit in the United States, Abdul Baha insisted that every venue where he spoke all races. Abdul Baha took the bold step to speak at the fourth annual convention of the NAACP, 
which was considered a radical organization by many because of its vocal opposition to lynching of black people. There were lynchings every day in America. Abdu'l-Bahá impressed the entire NAACP membership by his presence and his strong absolute equality of human beings and how reprehensible it was to separate and persecute people based on skin color. He said, can we apply the test of racial color and say that man of a certain hue, white, black, brown, yellow, red, of his creator. His emphatic statements and actions in behalf of racial justice inspired the NAACP to name Abdu'l-Bahá as the man of the month in their national newsletter of May of 1912 for his staunch support of the NAACP and race amity in America. He was never silent when the issue of race unity was at hand. He called the Baha'is to convene interracial gatherings, which he called race amity conferences for the purpose of building those close relationships along racial lines. He spoke at Howard University in Washington, a historically black college. He said, I'm very happy to see you and thank God this is a meeting composed of both races, that both are gathered in perfect love and harmony. I hope that this becomes the example of universal harmony and love until no title remains except that of humanity. Such a title demonstrates the perfect world and is the cause of eternal glory and human happiness. At the Baptist Temple in Philadelphia, Abdu'l-Bahá spoke to 2,500 people saying, Baha'u'llah taught that prejudices, whether religious, racial, patriotic, or political, are destructive to the foundations of human development. Prejudices of any kind are destroyers of human happiness and welfare. Until they are dispelled, the advancement of the world of humanity is not possible. Yet racial, religious, and national biases are observed everywhere. For thousands of years, the world of humanity has been agitated and disturbed by prejudices. As long as it prevails, warfare, animosity, and hatred will continue. Therefore, if we seek to establish peace, we must cast aside this obstacle, for otherwise, agreement and composure are not to be attained. These were very challenging ideas in 1912, and a ideas today. We have so much work to do if we hope to build a society based on justice and fairness and unity. And we invite you to do what you can to make the vision of world peace and unity a reality. The world really needs these teachings today. We have had more than a hundred years to advance the vision of Abdu'l-Bahá. And what have we done? Have we done enough and that's a very good question, because so many of the issues he spoke of are still plaguing us, and they have yet to be deal with, dealt with. I've been a Baha'i long enough to have celebrated the 50th anniversary of Abdu'l-Baha's passing in 1971, and the 75th anniversary in 1996, and I lament that I haven't done enough. Maybe we will do better in the next hundred years. I hope so. After all, you know, 100 years is not all that much time. As a new Baha'i, I remember meeting many, many people who had the privilege of speaking with Abdu'l-Bahá face to face. We live close to our friend Wendy. Her grandfather, Curtis Kelsey, performed many services in the Holy Land at the direction of Abdu'l-Bahá. Curtis was present at Abdu'l-Bahá's funeral and many of the photographs we have of the thousands of mourners in the street of Haifa were taken by Mr. Kelsey. I got to embrace Mr. Kelsey the day after I joined the Baha'i faith. I got to know him. In fact, Curtis Kelsey is buried just a few miles from Clearwater over there on St. Pete. In my own house, I welcomed Ab who was a young boy in Haifa, would attend Abdul Baha's prayer gatherings for the children. The classes Bob in the room that is now the burial place of Abdu'l-Bahá. 
Aziz went to hundreds of those meetings with Abdul Baha and took sweets from his own hand. And this man in my house held our daughter in his arms. So with all of these beautiful memories in my own mind, I feel that, that we're very close to the time that Abdul Baha walked among us. It's a very personal and precious kind of nearness for me. Abdul Baha asked the Baha'is to focus on racial justice, equality of women and men, establishing world peace, bringing together the East and the West, and that wonderful vision of the people of the world unfurling a giant banner, or maybe a million giant banners that will proclaim the reality of the oneness of mankind. I'd like to just take a couple of minutes in closing to discuss how that gets done. How will we ever find a way to unite the earth and its people? Are we hopeless? Are we destined to keep hating each other, fighting each other, being separate? The Baha'is think otherwise. The Baha'is believe that the destiny of the human race is, race is to reach maturity, to cast aside our childish and destructive patterns of separation and strife. The world suffers today from the very same sickness that Abdu'l Baha confronted in 1912. Yet we believe that the destiny of people on this planet is that we will finally become united and harmonized. We are promised that we are entering a new age of justice and fairness and love and unity. But how? What are the exact steps that we can take? How will we human beings act over the next hundred years? How will we celebrate the 200th anniversary of Abdu'l Baha's passing? How can we change the world to move closer to his vision? Here's one idea. In the Baha'i writings, we find this amazing statement from Baha'u'llah. He says, the betterment of the world and its people accomplished through pure and goodly deeds, through commendable and seemly conduct. I'll read it again. The betterment of the world can be accomplished through pure and goodly deeds, through commendable and seemly conduct. To me, this means that when the people of the world will start acting the way human beings should act, the world will get better. When we act in a just way and we demand that others act with justice and fairness, the world gets better. For instance, when men and women are truly equal, equal education, equal pay, equal opportunity, this means that the voices of women will have the same force and power as the voices of men. And that will bring an incredible moral force into this world. And when that force exerts itself, different kinds of decisions will become more just and honorable and fair. The Baha'i writings say that when equality of sexes is established, this will signal the end to war because women will not allow their sons to kill the sons of other women. Men and women equally empowered and respected will find other ways, peaceful ways, to resolve problems, and war will surely end. The maturity of the human race means that when racial justice is established, when prejudice is eliminated, when we recognize and act on the reality that there is only one race, the human race, the world will change. When we can finally raise aloft the banner of the oneness of mankind, the causes of warfare will finally be gone. And if war, so many other possibilities emerge. For instance, the children of the world will have the opportunities that so many were deprived of before. People who have been prevented from being educated, who have been denied from giving their service to humanity, those who have been pushed to the side or left out entirely, these people will finally be able to make their unique contribution to the betterment of the world and serve others. These people will bring such brain power that this world will change. Imagine the invention, the creativity, the advances in arts and sciences, cures for diseases, the end of poverty, the mitigation of our climate change. It, it'll be like a new birth for our planet, a new world. But here's the key. The key is that we must change ourselves. We must be the first ones to change 
and then the first ones to act. It's in the acts that we need to change the moral balance in this world. Right now, we're at a point where we need to have more and more people get busy with those goodly deeds that Baha'u'llah talks about and those commendable conduct things, those things that will show that we mean it, that will show that we are a part of it. And this is how we start. It will emanate from the human heart. Not only your heart, but first, my heart. One of us needs to look in a mirror and say, my heart first. Each one of us must take on that personal responsibility. Abdu'l-Bahá in so many speeches, in so many letters, in so many books, has said that the human beings must be of service to each other. This is the destiny, the highest calling of a human being, to be a servant. Abdu'l-Bahá's very name means servant. Abdul means servant. He urges the Baha'is to simply practice kindness and service to others every day. This. Be sincerely kind, not in appearance only. Let each one of God's loved ones center his attention on this, to be the Lord's mercy to man, to be the Lord's grace. Let him do some good to every person whose path he crosseth and be of some benefit to him. Let him improve the character of each and all and reorient the minds of men. In this way, listen to this, in this way, the light of divine guidance will shine forth and the blessings of God will cradle all mankind. Is light, no matter in what abode it dwelleth, and hate is darkness, no matter where, it may make its nest. It's a very long road to change the world, but it must begin with changing our own selves. It begins with each of us loving each other, becoming true friends, genuinely caring about each other, serving and even sacrificing ourselves for each other, even sacrificing ourselves for each other. We want to bring our very best to this world. It's going to take dedication and strength and sacrifice. And speaking about being sacrifices for each other, Abdu'l-Bahá said this, Behold a candle, how it gives its light. It weeps its life away, drop by drop, in order to give forth its flame of light. The candle sacrifices its existence to bring light and warmth. How wonderful when a mature humanity will act in brave and sacrificial ways. How wonderful when those who have been separated are finally united. How wonderful when people unable to serve because of prejudice and hatred are permitted to make their own contribution to the advancement of civilization. How wonderful when this world will change in so many small ways that will inspire an organic change in how we relate to each other on a global level. How wonderful that Abdu'l-Bahá came to America to change us, to make us better people, to call us to action. Abdu'l-Bahá gave us the vision, and now it's time for each of us to be inspired by that vision and get busy with actions. You know, those deeds, those pure and goodly deeds, and all of that commendable conduct. How do we make the world better? The betterment of the world can be accomplished through pure and goodly deeds, through commendable and seemly conduct. I am so happy to be with you today in this season of change, in this centenary year, as we note the passing of Abdu'l-Bahá and we do our part to change the world. Thanks to all of you for listening. Thank you, John. It's you. I want to uh, actually share a quote that is completely uh, the conclusion, I think, of everything we've said here for everyone that has joined, everyone who's watching, anyone who has anything to say after this in their own personal lives to their friends. There is a quote from Abdu'l-Bahá from Paris Talks. 
and it says, none has ever taught, sorry, none has ever thought that war and hate are good. Everyone agrees in saying that love and kindness are best. Love manifests itself, manif love manifests its reality in deeds, not only in words. These alone are without effect. In order that love may manifest its power, there must be an object, an instrument, a motive. We must find a way of spreading love among the sons of humanity. It's from Paris Talks. It's beautiful. What do you think of this quote? I love it. It's beautiful. So, you know, I, I had 10,000 quotes I left out of this talk. I just want you to know that. <laughs> And they're all fantastic. They are why, all why do you think Abdulbaba talks so much about this subject? I'm sorry? Why do you think Abdulbaba talks so much about this one subject? Because, because we weren't doing it. Because we have to do it. This is a radical change in the history of the world. This is a radical change in, in human behavior. It's, it's, it's people going from the infancy of the human race to the maturity of the human race. That's why you talked about it, so that we wouldn't forget what the heck we're supposed to do. So, and remember one presentation you had made, if you were to sum up the Baha'i faith in one word, I think you said it was a Jeopardy question um, or, or some game show. If you were yeah. to sum up the Baha'i faith in one word, what word would that be? It, 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 what do you think it is, John? I remember you said it was unity based That's, off of... I totally agree. Unity is the word. I found it funny because for anyone who wants to have unity, world unity, what do you have to have? You have to have love. So love without it, this element, which is love, you don't have unity of the family. You don't have unity of the town, community, neighborhood. You don't have unity of the world without that love. That's it. But, you know, it's, it's you know, the, the Baha'i teachings did not come to change my neighbor. We can't just say, but, you know, my neighbor really needs this. And, you know, this guy I work with really needs this. The Baha'i teachings came to change me. We've got to take it personally. We can't expect anybody else to change until we change. Otherwise, it's just pure hypocrisy. And um, the world doesn't have time for that. There are too many people suffering in the world who need this medicine. And, you know, obviously, it's got to be me. You know, I can encourage everybody in the world to do it. But the step that gets taken has got to be taken by me. And if we don't take it personally, we're not going to get very far. So you're saying I can't, I can't be hateful and then tell other people love other people. You listen, the world is full of good advice. And you know, John, I, I have great advice to help your life. But what I need right. is I need advice to help my life. I need to change Bob. And that's the, that's the deal. All right. So it starts within. We have to start it within ourselves if we want to change the world around us. You know, at the end of World War I, Abdu'l-Bahá, as they were signing the Treaty of uh, Paris, he said, these people signed the treaty and they still hate each other. In their inmost hearts, they hate each other. They don't trust each other. They don't want to have anything to do with each other. And he said, those are the seeds that are sown for the next war which of course became World War II. It is what's in the human heart. He said this when he came to Lake Mohawk and spoke at that giant peace conference. He said, forget about all this treaty stuff and sovereignty stuff. He said, it's the human heart. When the human heart will reject war, there are not gonna be any soldiers, are there? That's the deal. So it's, it, it's, it's a heart issue. Same thing with race unity, same thing with equality of women and men. You know, same thing with the unity of religions, how we can respect each other's religion. You know, it's, it, it's, it's honestly common sense. And uh, I think everybody agrees that it's common sense. And the trick is, how do you do it? And the way you do it is you sacrifice yourself and you put aside your own opinions and you do sacrificial things. You help people. You just help people. You know, I've, I've got to go in a couple of minutes, but I'll tell you, uh, this is... This is an interesting story. In the United States, there were, there were a thousand newspapers when Abdu'l-Bahá was here. In New York City, there were 11 newspapers. They used to fight like crazy to get stories of Abdu'l-Bahá. 
It was incredible. Uh, 10,000 articles written in major newspapers uh, about Abdu'l-Bahá. And in Boston, there were uh, eight newspapers, and seven of these newspapers had met Abdu'l-Bahá at the train station to have a, an interview with him. And each one of the reporters got it. And there was a young, young reporter who ran up from a newspaper, and he had missed uh, his time or something. And Abdu'l-Bahá is leaving on the train, and he said, I have one question for you. And Abdu'l-Bahá said, okay, I have time for one question. And he said, tell me all about your religion. And the train is there, they're, they're, they're calling people to get on the train. And Abdu'l-Bahá said, in 13 seconds, my perpetual religion is service to mankind. If you're doing service to mankind, it doesn't matter what you call yourself. You're doing what a human being is supposed to do. Serve, 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 serve others. Don't think that you yourself is the center of the universe. To serve others, to give yourself up like the candle. And that's the key, John. That's the key that I see, is that it takes individuals willing to say, okay, my, wife, my life is worth nothing if I'm not serving other people. And I, I think that that's a pretty good summary that Abdu'l-Bahá made. My perpetual religion is service to mankind. Kind of makes theology take a back seat, doesn't it? Kind of makes all those little dancing on the angels dancing on the head of a pin and all of those kinds of uh, arguments that people have about theology. It makes it go away. If your religion means service to humanity. So. John, I apologize. I've got to go. There may be some other folks who want to uh, who want to talk. I apologize. I've got another speaking engagement. Uh, Joan McGovern, my God, thank you so much for reading that prayer for us. Um, that, uh, uh, it was always a pleasure to hear you. Always a pleasure to see you. Please come. Uh, hey, well, if they invite me back, I'll come, of course. But um, Joan, I love you. Don't, 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 don't tell my wife, okay? <laughs> okay. See you guys later. Love you all so much. Robert, Mark, Hushang, my goodness, look at all these beautiful people. See you later. See you later, Bob. Take care. And, and for those of you that have joined us today, um, we appreciate it. You're able to make it on Zoom. The Facebook and the YouTube video recordings will be made available later. Uh, it is October 31st, 2021, we'll be making the recordings available online.